So, good everyone, and Your Excellency, dear friends of humanity and planet Earth, we are, scientific evidence shows clearly, facing existential risks. I would like to congratulate the Club of Rome for so persistently being a voice on science-based evidence for the need of a transformation to a sustainable future for humanity on Earth during this exponential rise of environmental threats that actually has taken us to a point where we today have ample evidence, as we did not have 1972, that we're starting to hit the biophysical ceiling of hardwired processes that regulates the stability of the whole Earth system. We're even seeing that Earth system is starting to send invoices back to the economy. We may actually make the final, final bookkeeping on 2018 as the first year when the Earth system really sent invoices across the entire economy starting off with the devastating 200 plus deaths in Japan after heat waves and floods, crossing over to the unprecedented droughts in the middle of the winter in Australia and the forest fires in California, the worst ever recorded, still ongoing actually to a large extent. In Canada, waves, heat waves in Kerala, the rains during the monsoon amplified by global warming to a point where the whole state now has to be reconstructed from scratch. The record temperatures, never before have we measured 51.2 degrees Celsius on the continent of Africa. The heat waves in Europe, we actually have to now rewrite all the school books in my home country, Sweden, because the highest point in the country has no longer that point. Kebnekais has now been bypassed because of melting glaciers. We have the Hurricane Michael hitting at a factor four just following Florence, the highest uh, recorded wind speed on land in the U.S. soil. And President Barack Obama, the last thing he does before stepping out of the White House is gather science on reminding humanity that average temperature rise of two degrees Celsius actually means a five degrees Celsius world in the Arctic. I mention this because I would argue that even the vast majority of climate denialists would agree that is not a good future. Now, we have today then so much evidence of the extreme events, but we also have so much evidence accumulated over the last decades that the planet is resilient up to a certain point, but then we cross thresholds and we are at risk of having self-amplifying warming from permafrost thawing and methane release, accelerated sea ice melt in the Arctic with albedo changes, the tremendous risk of a tipping point in the Amazon rainforest, the evidence of the Nino shifts, the jet stream, the coral reef systems that are today at a point of collapse and irreversibility, 30% of the Great Barrier Reef are lost to humanity forever. We are now at a point where we can say for certain that when the Club of Rome was born, the Earth system was resilient enough to deliver unsustainable well-being on the short term. She subsidized us. But today, we've reached a saturation point where we are approaching points of potential irreversibility, which will not only lead to very, very high impacts and invoices back, but will also lead to potential irreversible thresholds that could take us to disastrous futures. That is why, together with John Schellenhuber and others, we published a few months back the first synthesis of trying to map out what would a two degree Celsius future bumped, caused by emission of greenhouse gases from fossil fuel burning mean in terms of losing resilience in the Earth system. And even a conservative assessment showed that we would bump up the average temperatures to roughly 2.5 degrees Celsius that could trigger a set of cascading domino effects that could actually move us into an irreversible hothouse Earth trajectory. This, dear friends, means that two degrees Celsius warming is no longer just an adaptation challenge. It might be the planetary threshold we, under all circumstances, both ethically and logically, need to avoid. Now, this is based on so much science, and it's just extraordinary our system science has advanced, has advanced over the last decades, from the paleoclimatic research all the way to the Earth system science on tipping elements. We know that over the last Pliocene, Pleistocene, we've had six to eight Milankovic cycles between glacial and interglacial periods. The interglacial periods, the shorter 15 to 30,000 year periods, are very, very narrow between zero to two degrees Celsius. In fact, the last time we had an interglacial in the Eemian was roughly two degrees Celsius warmer, and the Holocene being this nice, stable cycle in the middle of these interglacials. And we have, since the birth of the Rome Club, Club of Rome, boost ourselves up to the edge of these interglacials. So as far as we know today, our future is actually at risk 
of pushing ourselves outside of an interglacial stability landscape that could take us to a point way beyond through a planetary threshold. This lands in the conclusion that the scientific message, I would argue the most important one of all, is the simple equation that we have scientific evidence today that we've entered a whole new geological epoch, the Anthropocene. We are in the driving seat with the largest driver of change on Earth. Plus, the recognition that the Holocene, the equilibrium state of the planet since the last ice age, is the only state we know for certain that can support a modern world in an ethically responsible way. And third, that the world may very, very likely face potential catastrophic tipping points that requires from us to have the ability to have prosperity and equity within the boundaries, the guardrails of a stable Earth system. This is what led science to the planetary boundary framework, which was the logical next incremental step of scientific advancements. We've transgressed four of the nine planetary Earth systems that we, based on the scientific knowledge we have today, know with a high degree of certainty regulates the state of the Earth system. We are in a danger zone, and we therefore require rapid transformations. This is why we have actually translated the Paris Climate Agreement into what we call the Global Carbon Law, which shows us the trajectory we need to follow in order to stand a chance to avoid crossing the planetary threshold that can take us to a hothouse Earth. Now, just to summarize this very quickly to you, it is not only about shown in gray here, about bending the curve of fossil fuel emissions and basically reach what Jürgen Randers so eloquently showed here to a fossil fuel free world economy by mid-century in 30 years, shown here in gray. It's also about the transition of the world's food system in brown here as the world's single largest emitter of greenhouse gases to become a global carbon sink, an agriculture revolution. But not even that is enough. We need to also, in green and blue here, maintain the resilience of land and ocean systems to a point where we can rest assured that it is still able to be our best friend, avoiding potential self-reinforcing hothouse Earth trajectories. And all of this gives us a 66% chance of success. I mean, that's a quite unsatisfactory probability for the outcome of humanity on Earth. But that is the transformation we're facing, and that is nothing less than the challenge. So the 1.5 degree Celsius report released last week was a great accomplishment. It was a scientific a call for arms, basically, showing that we only have a remaining carbon budget that now requires from us to bend the curve of emissions over the next two years, have a decarbonized world economy no later than 2040, 2050. We have no more than 10 years left in a fossil fuel-driven world economy. And that, interestingly, the IPCC concludes that we have the solutions to be able to do this, but we need the global actions to succeed. Now, the trajectories are now relatively well established. We have the risk patterns well established as well. I think to the left there is the most dramatic one showing in this ember diagram that coral reef systems in the world are very likely to be irreversibly lost even at a 1.5 degree Celsius future. So we are at an invoice point already. And the sustainable development goals, the 17 goals for a people planet agenda comes right as the framework for us in this mind shift as the minister pointed out for a roadmap for humanity in the future. But science is clear. This cannot be handled as it tends to be today, either as a left-handed minor agenda or, at best, as a Swedish smurgos board where you pick your goodies and just work on a few single goals. Oh no, dear friends, we need to now understand that this is nothing less than the planetary wedding cake for humanity where four of the goals are non-negotiable. Water, biodiversity, climate, and oceans. These are the planetary boundaries we have to remain within and prosper and have equity and success for humanity. This is the new mind shift, the new paradigm for humanity. And also, which of course is even more challenging, 2030 is only 12 years away. The Sustainable Development Goals is merely a milestone, a bullseye on a transformation journey towards an equitable future for humanity on a stable Earth system at 2050 and beyond. So that is what we set out to do in what Jürgen flagged up as being the grand launch today, which is actually the first time this is presented for the first time an effort of analyzing through different simulation scenarios of a global system dynamics model, what are the opportunities of meeting the sustainable development goals, the bullseye within a safe operating space on Earth, not only 2030, but 2050 and beyond. And um, I spilled some water as a symbol of tipping elements on this report, which I'm holding in my hand. We have 100 copies to 
Club of Rome, Rome of, uh, Club of Rome members, but also a number of hundred copies for everyone here. Uh, at the same time today, there will be a TED Global talk, which will be publicized and launched officially. In Norway, there's another event held in conjunction with this report release. It's been supported by the Global Climate, Global Challenges Foundation and the KR Foundation in Denmark. It's a, it's a real follow-up of the Limits to Growth work and World 3, including both a dynamic Earth system model with biosphere climate dynamics, but also an effort of getting the global economy represented in a fair way for seven regions in the world. And here's one representation of four of the SDGs studied in this simulation work on education, health, poverty, and, um, and longevity. And what you find is for these regions in the world, and these bubbles here show the seven regions, how they have empirically moved between 1980 and 2015. So these are the 100,000 data points used in this model. And then how we can use these converging trends towards regression equations to be able to connect the socioeconomic dynamics with the biophysical dynamics in this global systems model. And this gives us the opportunity to do for the first time what is uh, shown on the axis here, namely to explore, are we able to stay within planetary boundaries on the y-axis? Further up, you are in the green zone, more planetary boundaries safely uh, guarded. And on the x-axis, the number of SDGs that we can fulfill. The further to the right, the larger number of SDGs are we able to fulfill. So you want to be in the upper right-hand corner for a safe and just future within safe operating space on Earth. The model is based then on empirical data across the world from 90 80 to 2015. So what you see here is our journey so far. As we know, we have barely made some progress on the SDGs at the expense of the planet. We've been very successfully moving decisively out into the danger zone on destabilizing the Earth system. Business as usual to 2050 would take us in the following way. We may actually be able to accomplish by 2030 10 of the 17 goals, by 2050 11 or 12 of them but still at the expense of planetary boundaries, transgressing climate, water, biodiversity, land, putting ourselves at risk of self-amplified feedbacks that can take us away from stability. We also explored if you would bump up economic growth. Is there an economic development opportunity here? And not surprisingly, that takes us a little bit further on SDGs, but at the expense of the planet. And then we even tried, what if we do really, really give political leaders the chance to implement what we've agreed. Over 500 environmental multilateral agreements and do that within a conventional incremental paradigm we have today and it would give us a slightly better delivery on the planetary boundaries but barely any change on the SDGs. So the conclusion is that conventional development paradigms, however optimistic we are, will fail both on SDGs and on Earth system stability. So then we instead tried to explore a set of five transformative policy and engagement actions to consider, of which many of them you will certainly recognize. Decarbonizing the energy system, accelerated sustainable healthy food systems, new development models where we recognize the ecological civilization policy agenda in China with good economic development but through a circular economic paradigm, active inequality reduction, not allowing the 10 richest in the world to, or to own more than 40% of the capital in a nation. And finally, perhaps most importantly, really investing in girls in the world to get a stabilization of population development. If we put all this in the model, we end up in a situation where, yes, we start moving towards the right corner. Now, our message here is not that we've got the five correct transformations. The message is, dear friends, nothing less than transformations are needed for us to stand any chance of meeting the SDGs without jeopardizing the stability of the Earth system. And we now need to take on this challenge together. That's the big mind shift, the big mind shift of placing our aspirational socioeconomic goals, the sustainable development goals, the people plan agenda within the Earth system and having this once and for all to become an integrated whole Earth system development agenda where I would argue that the new definition of sustainable development is social inclusion and prosperity within planetary boundaries to have a chance to be able to have a future for humanity where every individual citizen can have a good life equitably which will require planetary stewardship. And I would argue that the Club of Rome is so well placed for the next 10 years to be an agent 
for that trust between all nations and all citizens on earth. Thank you very much.